thank you for joining us here at the Potter's House International Ministry. Here at TPHIM, we proudly proclaim that Jesus is Lord, love abounds, and everyone is an evangelist. We want you to know that there are four ways that you can continue to be a blessing to the kingdom. You can give first through text giving at 904-601-1695. Just text the word give and follow the prompt. The second way is online giving at tbhim.org or through the Ministry One Church app. Also, you can mail in your gifts to the Potter's House International Ministries at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. We thank you for your giving. We appreciate all that you do to help us to continue to be a blessing to our community. God some glory in this place tonight come on can you bless his holy name it's Wednesday night he is worthy to be praised he is worthy to be magnified can somebody shout glory are you ready to give God some glory let's start worship here at the potter's house hallelujah hallelujah thank you Lord glory to your name come on Cut those hands. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Ah, hallelujah. All right. Come on, clap those hands in here. Here we go, right here. Say, glory, glory, glory to our King. Glory, glory, glory yeah. to our King. To the Lamb who was slain for our
Hallelujah. Glory, glory to our King. Because our King is the everlasting God. And we bless your holy name in this place. We magnify you. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. How many know that the Lord is your light and your salvation? And you have nothing to fear. Can you just lift your hands and tell them, who shall I fear, God? Who shall I be afraid? Because you're with me. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Glory. Listen, we say this. Hallelujah. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? And whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? And whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. Woo! And I will wait on you. You. And I will trust in you. Yes, I will. And I will trust in you. Ooh. Come on, say the Lord is. The Lord is my light. Thank you, God. Come on, say, whom shall I fear? And whom shall I be afraid? Come on, say, the Lord is yeah. Hallelujah. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? And I will wait on you. We're going to wait on you. Wait on you. Yes, sir. And I will trust in you. Till I die, till I die, yeah. I will trust in you. Thank you, Lord. We say this, we declare. I will remain comforted in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. How many know that? Yeah. I will remain comforted in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. The Lord. God. Come on, say, whom shall I? Oh, God, yes, you. Oh, God, yes, you. You are my light and my salvation, Lord. Oh, God, yes, and I will wait on you. Thank you, Jesus. And I will wait on you. I will, yes I 
should we say? I will remain comforted in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. I will remain comforted in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Somebody help me out. I will. You want to see his goodness. How many really want to see it tonight? Come on, somebody lift your hand and just know that the Lord got you. It's nothing like trusting in his name. Come on, one more time. We say, I will remain. I will remain. Yes, I will. I will see the goodness of the I want you to bless him if you trust him. I want you to bless his holy name if you really trust him. I want you to take this morning and to magnify his name if you really trust him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. We trust your name. We trust who you are. For time and time again, you have given us incredible joy. And out of that joy comes your strength. And I'm so grateful that this strength not only carries me, but in times where I don't feel like I want to be bothered, when I feel like I don't belong to you, you reach. You reach for me. You reach for me. That joy, that strength begins to reach for me. And I get renewed each and every day, each and every moment of my life. I'm so grateful for it. Can you lift your hands in this place? And begin to worship our God. Thank you, Jesus. You are my strength. Thank you, Lord. Strength like no other. Thank you, Jesus. Strength like no other. Reaches to me. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me. Come on, help me out. Say, you are my strength. Say, you are my strength. Come on, somebody say, strength like no other. Strength like no other. Somebody say, in the fullness of, say, in the fullness of your grace. Come on, somebody say, in the power. Strength, yeah. And we say strength. 
Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reaches to me. Reaches to me. So, Father, as we stand before you tonight in this house of worship, this house of prayer for all people, those that are watching God online, and I pray, God, that you would permeate the airways by your power and your might, that you would counsel the assignment of the enemy, the prince and the power of the air, and that you would allow people tonight to receive what the Spirit is saying to the church. Bless me now. Help me touch my mind, my heart. Touch my tongue. Let me say words, God, that only you would desire us to hear tonight. Let me be accurate tonight. Help me, God, to help somebody tonight in this cancel culture. I believe that you are still God and God all by yourself. So bless us. Thank you for safe travel, safe return to the city of Jacksonville. Thank you, God, for bringing me home to the people that you've assigned me to. Thank you for protecting me and my wife on the airplane in the cities in which we visited. And we love you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, put those hands together and glorify God. He is worthy. Thank you, singers. I'm going to need y'all to stay close. I may go somewhere tonight. God bless you. I thank you so much. You may be seated in the presence of God. Those of you at home, if you're standing, you can remain standing and walk around and do what you do. But stay focused. Get focused now to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I'm so thankful to God. We're going to balance this out. I'm thankful to God for an opportunity. We just got back in from the wonderful state of Nevada. We spent eight days out in the desert, um, literally 127 degrees a couple of days ago uh, while we were out there. It was so hot. Birds were walking. It was just hot. It was uh, extremely hot. We had a great time of rest, totally unplugged from everything and everybody. I did have a chance to chat with my friend, Randall Cunningham, former Philadelphia Eagle quarterback, all pro quarterback, and uh, he's a funny guy. We've done some radio together, podcasts, and uh, we had a great laugh. And did we, we did get to meet a couple. God used us to minister to a, a, a couple. I call them a young couple, um, Pastor Anthony and Elnora No-No Harris. And um, it was a blessing, and I'm grateful to God for having met them and I'm sure that they have already posted and already shared they were blessed in getting to know us and making that connection so we can't go anywhere without ministering to somebody and uh and God was 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 good um I'm sure my wife and I went to Carmine's you ever been to Carmine's uh you know you know that they serve you one order lasagna feeds five people and uh, so whether you by yourself or with a crowd, you order one order. And um, one order spaghetti feeds five people. And so on and so on and so on. So I ordered spaghetti, my wife ordered lasagna. And we had so much left over, they just throw it out. That's just the way they do it. I eat there in New York often, but they have one in Vegas. And uh, I'm sure uh, this one guy, I still remember the look in his eyes. Uh, we got done and we couldn't throw that food out, no way. So we had them to uh, bag it up. And then uh, we went out on the strip and uh, looking for uh, homeless, hungry, to try to find somebody uh, who could utilize it, who would eat it and not be wasted. My wife started telling me about all the quackiola belly babies that she feeds in Africa, that she sends money to monthly. And uh, we went out and, and, and there was this one guy that was laying there, he was just, it was 120 degrees, he laying there, and we just sat it next to him, so when he woke up, he, obviously he'd have something to eat, but then this other guy, I started chatting with him, and he looked at me and asked him, what are you doing, how are you doing, he said, anything, and I said, what about Carmine's? We just came and had this big bag in my hand, he looked at me like, what? Please, and, uh, and, um, and he was excited. Um, Jesus said, when I was hungry, 
you fed me. Come on, when I was naked, you clothed me. I think that if we would just begin to do the simple things, the little things in life, think out of the box and always think forward and, and thinking to bless somebody and not all the time just bless yourself. I believe that the church would have an impact and that we could make a difference in this world. How many are ready to make a difference in this world? A special shout out to my son Brent Brown who lost his son um, while we were gone and um, your oldest son, am I right? And uh, he's up here worshiping tonight. Come on, y'all, singing tonight. That's a, that blessed me. That literally blessed my socks off. Um, that really did. That really blessed me. I have a son. And, um, you know, I think I'm a pretty tough guy, but I don't know. I just don't know. And I say things like that, and some people kind of get in the book. You, you, listen, you, you have to live life, and you have to be prepared for life. I'm prepared for whatever life brings me. I just love hard, and I love my children. I love people. Jesus got to the tomb of Lazarus, and it was just his friend. And the Bible says that God the Son wept. And if you don't learn how to emote, or if you don't have feelings, you can cross anybody, do anybody wrong, you can say anything to anybody, it won't matter to you. But when you know how to emote and know how to love, then it will constrain you. It'll keep you from acting the fool, going off, it'll keep you from offending people and being upset with folk for no apparent reason at all. So again, I say thank you, Brent, for demonstrating that strength. Uh, Cause that song is pretty accurate right now. You are my strength. And um, so I'm grateful. In the book of Psalms, chapter 32, I'm going to walk us through this tonight. I've been gone for eight days, so I'm not getting in a big hurry tonight. I'm, I'm thankful for all that happened in my absence, those of you that worked and labored. Um, thank you for being on post and doing what you've got to do. This is strategic from the start to the end, especially the beginning, uh, musically in the beginning and then the, at the end of this thing. So I'm so thankful for musicians and singers that are skillful and anointed, that do what they do. I'm so grateful. Psalm 32, verse one. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in, and in whose spirit there is no guile or deceit. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Last verse. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Tonight, from the subject, Selah. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I will say to you that it was in the middle of my vacation that I woke up one morning about the fifth or the sixth day. I hadn't done anything as it pertains to ministry or preparing anything. I just wanted to clear my head and clean the slate. But I heard so clear one morning, Selah, the word Selah. Selah occurred 74 times in the Bible. 71 times in the book of Psalms and three times in the book of Habakkuk. Are we on the screen? Selah. We're half a screen tonight or just one side? 
It is not exactly clear as to its exact meaning. When you see that word selah in there, um, scholars and historians are not really clear. Together, they're not really clear exactly what it meant and what it means, but all indications definitely indicate that it is a break in the action. It's a break in the action. This past week, I took a break in the action. What I'll call a sila. Uh, a much needed rest, a much, much needed vacation. Sila in the Psalms and in the back is actually a musical symbol used by the ancient psalmist. When we see it in our day's music, we see it in our modern music, there are markings on the day's music staff that are called rests, rests. Let me explain this to you. Let me give you the definition of a music rest. A music rest is a musical symbol that marks the absence of a note. Rests are written in a measure with no note where no note is played. And like music notes themselves on the staff, they are measured in length. Quarter, half, whole rest are the most common, even a quarter rest, or a um, whole, half, quarter, sixteen. It would look like this. Let me just show it to you. It would be a whole rest. That's what it would look like. A half rest, a quarter rest, and an eighth rest. Right, and then you would go to a 16. But the whole rest takes four beats. The half rest, two. The quarter rest, stay back where I was, two. And uh, the eighth rest, a half beat. This is what it would look like on the music staff. So you, those are the symbols. And on the staff, or in a bar, it would look like this. The whole rest is upside down, facing down. The half rest is up. The quarter rest is the squiggly little line. And the eighth rest looks like that. How many of y'all took music appreciation and took music? You remember this. So then, that whole rest takes four beats. Two beats on the half, one beat on the quarter, half beat on the eighth. Now, when mixed with musical notes, it looks like this. <clears throat> Now this is what the common staff looks like. This is four, four time, I meaning that's four beats per bar and four quarter notes per bar, four, four, which is your basic staff count. So you got one, two, three, four beats, but you notice one is a rest. So four beats would sound like this. One, two, three, four, four beats. But when you have a rest there, it goes one, two, rest, four. So you got four, but the rest there means that you rest for one beat there, and then you would rest, if you saw the whole uh, rest there, it would be four beats with no note, just four beats till you get to the next bar. So they're called music rest. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so Sila is a musical notation used by the psalmist that is equivalent uh, to these musical or music rests. So selah, again, means number one, a pause. Number two, a rest. And number three, a break for the purpose of reflection. So in the Psalms and in the back of when we find uh, Selah, it is time for us to pause. It is time for us to rest, to take a break for the purpose, though, of reflection. I guess that's why God gave me that word that morning, because while I was away, the music stopped. The sounds of people's voices ceased, and I took time out to reflect. And I realized that as I began to read the notes of my life, that after every so many bars that I live, there needs to be a sila, a time of rest. The 4-4 time signature is considered a bar, but also people talk about spitting bars. Bars are in rap music. It's a line of a rapper's lyrics, a, a good and a clever verse in the rap that rhymes. When you get a bar, you hear people talking about, and he was spitting them bars like I did the other day. You know, you know, like fighting God is like fighting Ali. Your hands can't hit, but your eyes can't see. 
Oh, everybody liked the one about I was just walking the dog and everybody staring and out of nowhere, here comes Karen. <laughs> and so those were bars in the song. And usually after an 8-8 bar hook, is this thing called, in this thing called life, sometimes we need to pause, reflect, and take a break. So in our text here in Psalms, and those three times in the back of Selah, is a call to calm reflection on what was just stated. It is a time to stop for a minute and reflect on what just happened. It's the most ubiquitous of musical terms found in the Psalms. <laughs> That's a big word for just most used, most widespread. It's the equivalent of an interlude when there's a break in a performance, we have an interlude. My wife and I have been to several Broadway plays and there's always an interlude. These interludes are in theater and music productions often. It's an opportunity for the people to relieve themselves, especially when you get over 60, and to get something to eat or something to drink. It has to pay for the show. And then secondly, it's an opportunity for those who are performing to take a break and to get some rest or maybe change costumes or even change out the scenes. It's an interlude. Psalm 32 is attributed to the one and only King David. I don't think that any natural man on this planet who ever lived helps us as Christians as much as David. David was God's man. David was a man of God. David was God's friend. David was God's great worshiper. David was God's great warrior, but he was also God's great sinner. Yep, there, were, there are not too many people recorded in the scriptures that were as anointed as David that could out David. <laughs> David had one heck of a sin resume. Adultery, murder, arranging the death of Bathsheba's husband, covering it up. He was often a fugitive, running from God's guidance and justice, running from his enemies for extended periods of time. He didn't listen to the wise counsel of Joab and others. He failed to discipline his children. These things often led, led uh, old David, wonderful King David, uh, to be miserable, to be unfulfilled, uh, to live in anxiety in fear often of losing his life, his enemies, his foes would often come in to try and eat up his flesh. He was always over-concerned and nervous about his private life becoming public knowledge. Imagine David having um, <clears throat> sexed up Bathsheba and, and killed her husband. Imagine that the people that David sent to bring him Bathsheba and the people that David told to pull back from Uriah are still members of his church. They're still on his staff. They're still with him, serving with him in the kingdom. And David had to live that way, knowing what he had done and knowing that the people knew what he had done. And yet God chose him uh, to be his man. With this said, can I show you how God saw this man, David? We see his resume, right? And we look at it and go, mm, oh, woo. But look at what Acts 13, 22 says. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Wow, you missed that, didn't you? God called David a man after his own heart. Didn't you just hear his resume? How, God? Why would you call David a man after your own heart? 1 Samuel 16, 7 explains it. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's how. God sees what man cannot see. Man has a tendency to read the bars of your life and head right into judgment about what you did without stopping for a moment or pausing to reflect on who you really are. Man will look at you, man will think they know about you and go right for the jugular. Y'all missed that. For the most part, 
what we did ain't who we are. And that's where David was, right? So what does God do with this man with issues galore? What does he do to help him in his quest to serve him? God sends him a personal prophetic encounter to help him get his outward acts to match his inward condition. And I think a lot of us, all of us, spend the rest of our life trying to get our outward acts, come on y'all, to match our inward condition. It's called sanctification. It's an ongoing process when we become like him, when we put off the old and put on the new, when we deny ourselves daily, when we are, are shaped and formed into the image of Christ, when we're putting off things, we're growing, we're maturing, we're stopping this and stopping that. It doesn't make us more saved, but it will make you more holy. It will make you more sanctified. And sanctification is a continued process that will take place until Jesus comes back again. Tell somebody, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. And so what it is, is inside, we're as, we're as holy or saved as we're ever going to be. We have this imputed righteousness where we're standing in right standing before God. Our position with God is right. Our condition before God is what gets messed up. So David spends his time working on and God helps him to work on matching his outward acts with his inward condition. So a man by the name of Nathan is sent by God, not even to judge God's man, but he comes along with a word to help God's man see himself. And that's what God does with messages like this. That's why it's so humming here because God will send a word to cause you to examine yourself. Some of y'all try to get around it. You put your head down. You won't look up at me. You don't want me to see your eyes. You try to write and take a lot of notes. This ain't no note-taking session tonight. This is going to conclude with an examination of yourself so that what's on your outside can begin to match how you really are conditionally on the inside. Because how many of you know y'all, some saved folk, I mean, people can testify to do it to me all the time and says, I know I'm saved. I just got this in my life. And that in my life and the world writes you off but God doesn't see like man sees come on man looks at the outward appearance but God looks on the heart I'm sorry I've, I've got to get to this story and, and but I also want to read the story because I can't assume that everybody knows everything I'm talking about when I said that God sends a prophetic encounter some of you knew that I was talking about Nathan and you know who Nathan is others of you don't have a clue so let me read this story. I got to do it. It's possible. It's powerful. Second Samuel 12, verse 1 through 10. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. He shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Verse 4, now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I know that you came over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Maybe you don't know the story, but he explained it. David had committed this serious sin of adultery and murder and cover up. 
and, and all of these things. And he says, it's like the one man who had one little ewe lamb. And there was another man who had multitudes. And when somebody came in, he took the one man's lamb that was precious to him. And he served it up instead of taking out of one of his many. And God says, David, that man, what do you think about him? David said, that man is worthy of penalty of death. He needs to die and to pay back. And God says, you the man. But you're a man after my own heart. And you will do everything that I call you to do. Especially if you respond to this prophetic encounter properly. And you know the story in Psalm 51. David repents. And David gets right with God. How many of you can appreciate God's personal prophetic encounter that has helped you to get your act together. Nathan confronted David privately. And how many of y'all thank God for private deliverances? He didn't make it public. Even though many knew, God still covered him. Has anybody here ever done something and God covered you? And, and, and other people knew, but it never, it never hit the press. It never was made public. Come on, how many of y'all are thankful for the grace and the mercy of God Almighty? I know some of y'all almost thought you're going to have to leave town. You're going to have to get out of, you, I love that commercial. I love that commercial. Oh, it's a, not a commercial. I think I saw it on, on the internet where, uh, if you're on the internet, you know it was true. So, where the guy had his phone. And his wife says, uh, this is so funny. He says, uh, baby, I need to see your phone. He said, where do you see my phone? He said, I want to go through it. I need to look at some things in it. So he hands her the phone. Then he just walks out of the room. And then you see him in the background with both of his suitcases. <laughs> <laughs> he just gets to the door and head out and wave at everybody. And say, well, mama, get through with that. I'm gone. I'm, it's over. But how many, how many all are glad that God has a way of protecting and, and, and being your refuge and, and being your shield with your crazy self? God didn't condemn you, did he? He didn't point a finger at you, did he? He didn't expose you publicly, did he? Come on, I'm talking about the loving kindness and the tender mercy of God. I'm talking about God, our refuge, and God, our strength. He sent a person. He sent a word. He sent an encounter so that you can see yourself in order that you might repent. Turn back to him. Get right with him. Tell somebody, repent, repent, repent. You can see it with Jesus. God never intended to condemn us. For the Bible says in John 3, 17, that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So when you get a woman caught in a very act of adultery and people have stones in their hands to kill them, Jesus says, he that has not sinned, that has not sinned and has no sin, you cast the first stone. And if you're wise and been around a while, from the oldest to the least, they turned and walked away. Those of us who've been around a long time, we know better than to throw a rock at somebody. We know better than to try to get a splinter out of our brother's eye with a telegram pole in our own eye. Psalm 32 records for us the emotional roller coaster ride of sin and repentance. Now, be sure sin has ultimate consequences. You know, somebody talks about sinning and a license to sin and turning the grace of God into lasciviousness when we talk about grace and we talk about God's ability to cover. No human being on earth has the power to give somebody a license to sin. Some of y'all can't even get a driver's license. You definitely ain't going to get a license to sin from man. But God allows things to happen in our lives. And sin does have consequences if we don't respond properly. And even if we do respond properly, remember, God said to David that the sword shall not leave your house. When it got time for the building of the temple, David wanted to build a temple for God. All he could do was raise the offering. God said, because of the blood on your hands, you will not build me a temple. 
Solomon had to build the temple. There are consequences. The family was jacked up. His children were messed up. There are consequences. But God has given us provision for dealing with our sin and as we live this life. And I thank God for the new covenant. I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ, the efficacious blood of Jesus. So Psalm 32 is, is a song of instruction. These are songs, these, these chapters and verses. It's a song of instruction and wisdom that helps us find forgiveness. It's called a misgale psalm or a masgale psalm. It's a song of wisdom, an instructional song. It's a song that when played or sung, it requires skill and excellence. That's what I love about our band and our musicians and singers and voices. Uh, psalm 33 says we should do it skillfully. We should do it with excellence. So a masculine song, this instruction, is aimed at bringing reckless man to spiritual understanding. So the masculine psalm is purposed to give man the true wisdom and the true understanding of why things are occurring in his life like they are. So this psalm is written out of experiences of David to help those who would hear it, sung, or read it to know how God works in the lives of people who need his help. 13 of these 150 recorded songs are masculine psalms. These 13 masculine songs, if you would, are recorded and directed at those whose life, listen carefully, may be secretly spinning out of control. That's how lives spin out of control. You know that, right? Secretly. They don't spin out of control publicly. It starts privately. So God gives David this song to help people, the people of God, <laughs> who are privately and secretly about to crash and burn. How many of you have ever been at that place in your life where you felt like you were about to crash and burn? That if something didn't happen real quick, something was going to happen real quick. Come on, I need some real people. Just lay back on the couch tonight. Let's have this therapy session. You're about to crash and burn. You get out of control. Mishael Psalms or Mashael Psalms are for people who are now and who may be about to engage in something that could mess up their relationship with God, their families, and their friends. These songs are for people who are about to engage in something that can destroy themselves and ruin their reputations. David writes this song to help us. They were written for people who are entangled with other people. Uh, these types of songs are for people who are even entangled with the devil and entangled in life itself and need to step back and see law and pause for a moment. So this is why we have for a topic on this day, see law. Not just four beats, not just two beats, not just a half beat, but take however long you need to reflect to step back and get your act together. Come on, tell somebody, get your act together. Get your act together. Come on, say it. Get your act together. Let's read. David says, Psalm 32, 1 and 2, as I pull it to a close. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. David says there are some things that can make a man happy. He attaches being blessed to four different types of sin. Literally four things that plagued his life. And he's happy to be free from them now. And he's saying you can be happy too if you get freed from these things. Number one, transgression. Transgression is crossing the line, doing what's prohibited. Number two, sin. Sin, of course, is missing the mark. Not doing what you know to do. Not doing what you've been commanded to do. Disobeying God. Number three, iniquity. Moral distortion or perversion. What is contrary to equity and justice. That's why he says, depart from me, you work of iniquity. You never showed justice or equity amongst people. You never showed a change in your life. You were always stuck on stupid and stuck on yourself and made life miserable for other people. And number four, deceit, which is fraud and guile, deception. All of us have sinned and been guilty in all of these areas before we let Christ 
have control of our lives. We're not completely free, many of us, from a lot of these things, but you need to know what they are. And David said these four things, if they're dealt with properly, properly can make a man or a woman of God happy as a whole get out. He lists these things that it takes to remedy these sinful activities. He, 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 he gives us the remedy for man's sinfulness. Number one, know what he said? Forgiveness. Number two, he used the word covering. Number three, he used the word imputation. And number four, he used the phrase annihilation. So here it is. Transgressions. Remember, that was the first one, right? Must be forgiven. You see it? Forgiveness. Forgiven. Sins. That's what he mentioned. Secondly, must be covered. Covered. Y'all not getting this. Iniquity takes imputation. It has to be given. Your sins have to be forgiven. They have to be covered. But also, there needs to be imputation for he is the propitiation for our sins. And he is imputed unto us, imputed unto us his righteousness. And then deceit must be annihilated. The Bible said in Jesus in whom spirit is no guile. So you got to see this, y'all. We need forgiveness. We need covering. We need imputation. We need annihilation. For what? Our transgressions, our sins, our iniquity, and our deceit. Now keep in mind that this song was written after Psalm 51. Don't let the order in the book fool you. This was after his encounter with Nathan. This is the chapter when David in Psalm 51 repents and asks God to forgive, to cover, to impute, and to annihilate the sin that's in his life. David knows what he's talking about. David said, I got my joy back. He said, God, return unto me the joy of thy salvation. Wash me with hyssop. Clean me and I'll be made whole. I'll read some of them for you. Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2. Have mercy, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me. From my sin, you missed it. Verse 5, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He knew that we were born. Remember, we're shaping iniquity. We're born in iniquity, shaping in sin. Verse number 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Look who he's appealing to, God. Only God can cleanse him. Only God can wash him. Only God, Psalm 51, 10, create me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me so Nathan confronts him he sees himself he sees his sin he sees his deceit he sees his iniquity he sees his transgression and he wants the joy back his bones are waxing hard and the sin has found him out and he's walking about with unconfessed sin in his life and he says God help me I've been confronted you've been good to me you've shown me myself now God I want to be right and I know you can make me right you can make me whole again what can why Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In Psalm 32 and 1 and 2, David is actually giving us the formula for real success. The joy in the presence of God in our life. That's real success. By success, I mean a life of forgiveness. I mean being covered by the blood. I mean living by the imputed righteousness of Jesus. Having had your old nature annihilated by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit that will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. So if you really are successful in life and living your best life now, it's because you've been forgiven. You've been covered. You've been had imputed righteousness and your, your, your old life has been annihilated. You are dead and your life is hid with God in Christ. Christ. Come on, you died with him. You were crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he lets you live, not, not you, but Christ lives in you. And the faith, the work, the, the life you now live in, in, in this flesh, you live it by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself and died for you. So success is a life that has been changed, not just for our own benefit, but also for the benefit of others. When you're free, you can then be used to free others. Psalm 51, David says in verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then 
I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. If you save me, I will do my best to help save others. If you forgive me, I will warn others. I will keep people from having to go down the same path that I've gone down. And that's what some of y'all need to remember. You went through the hell that you went through, not for you, but you went through it for somebody else. God knew that if he can show a model of what it's like to be forgiven and to be uh, uh, restored, if he, can, if he can find somebody that he can clean up, somebody that he can wash, somebody that ain't ashamed of their testimony, somebody that will admit, yeah, I did it. That's what I was, but that's not who I am now. That's what I did, but that's not who I am. Somebody who will say, you're just looking on the outward, but God saw something in me. God saw something in my heart. I'm a man. I'm a woman after God's own heart. I've always wanted to serve God. I've always wanted to do the will of God, but stuff and things tried to prevent me from getting there, but the devil should have kept me when he had me. He should have kept me when he had me. Now I'm free, and now that I'm free, I got to warn transgressors. I got to tell somebody else. I've got to preach this gospel, the same good news that saved me. I've got to share it with somebody else. God, thank you for the joy of your salvation. In verse 2, David says something that's very key to my message. He said, in whose spirit is no deceit. A successful person is one that has absolutely no deceit or deception as a part of their life or anywhere down in their heart. You can't be a deceitful, lying, manipulating person. The devil is a deceiver and the father of deceit and lies. Jesus said, you are of your father. The devil and the works of your father shall you do. So David says, blessed is that man. Blessed is the person who has been messed up, confused, in sin, and now broken by God. For his glory. Blesses the man who's been crushed beneath the weight of his own sin, transgression, iniquities, and deceitful heart. And who realizes that they need God if they're going to be successful in life. All of the education, all of your connections mean nothing. A little bit with the Lord is much better than a whole lot without him anyhow. We had stuff and things. My wife and I were doing exceptionally well. We would be multi-millionaires by now with our mindset, with our education, with our jobs and what we were doing. And I was moving along. We had a bunch of money in the bank and we had a nice house, print, you know, beautiful this, beautiful that. But I had this God-sized hole in me. Nothing I could drink or smoke. We went to see Prince while we were in Nevada. Um, I'll leave that right there. <laughs> Remember, it was Prince that was singing tonight I'm a party like it's 1999. So I thought, since I'm in Las Vegas, that I would take in this Prince review. When Prince was on the stage, this guy that was Prince, only thing my wife said to me was, Tim Donald looked more like Prince than he does. <laughs> And about, I don't know, 20 minutes into the show or whatever for the interlude, when Apollonia was out there doing her thing, I looked at my wife, she looked at me, and I said, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going to leave. You can follow behind me because we were sitting on the front. I don't want people to think we just got up and didn't like the show. She said, let me go first. <laughs> I'm going to leave that right there. David explains God's relationship with him. Here's my message. The first three verses, he gives us something to think about. And then we get to the Selahs. In verse 4, he says, I was sinning and it was God who was whooping my butt. Amen, David said, man. Verse 4, for day and night 
your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Remember the Selah in the interlude, the interchangeable, right? So here's what it says in another version. It says, every day you made life harder for me. I became like a dry land in the hot summertime. Selah. You see that? He says, Selah. So maybe if you can't sleep, if it appears that every day things are getting harder and harder, maybe it's God. Come on, you saw the movie. God's trying to tell you something. God's trying to tell you something. Can't sleep at night. You wonder why? Maybe God's trying to tell you something. How many of you waking up in the middle of the night, wasn't nothing right, nothing wrong, you just woke up, wasn't to use the bathroom, you didn't know why you were awake. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. You ever tried to do something and the more you try, the worse it gets? Some of y'all are so guilty of this, trying to work your own deliverance, trying to work your own salvation, trying to make a way. God ain't said nothing. You're just doing it. And it gets worse and worse. He said that happens to him. Matter of fact, three bars in this psalm end with a selah. Three bars. Verse number four ends with what? Selah. Verse number five ends with what? Selah. Verse number seven ends with what? Selah. Remember, the word selah is... And possibly is, remember I told you there's some question. A pause to reflect on what has been said or done. Or a, a change in tempo for the musicians. A break where we have to go maybe to another key. Possibly maybe even a time for a solo. Or just an interlude. Or maybe even a time to take an offering. <laughs> what we do know is that it's an obvious break in whatever is happening to reflect on what has previously occurred. So I dare you, here we go, to look back over your life just for a moment. I can guarantee you this. If you are a child of God, you will have a Selah moment. If you just look back over your life, you'll shake your head. And I know I see some people sometimes, they think about how good God been to them and they just, you ever do that? You ever just quiver? You ever just, just shake? You mm, groan in the spirit or, or you might even get your little Pentecostal hop going on or whatever you got to do. But it's because you're thinking about how good God is. You might even stop and take a praise break. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cried. Hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Come on, praise break. A Selah will make you stop and just tell the Lord, thank you. Come on, I've seen you in the bread aisle at Win Dixie. Thank you. Come on, I've seen you over there with the millions, squeezing them and getting the right one. Thank you. I've seen you just walking and just in the middle of the day with your headsets on and your favorite song on and the hand goes up in the air. Thank you. I've seen you when you roll out of bed in the morning before your feet hit the floor, before your eyes come open and you think, thank you. Come on, Jesus is right there with you. He's for you. He's not against you. And somebody ought to stop right there because you don't deserve it, because you ain't all that in a bag of chips. But he's so good. He's so great. He's so kind. His mercies are new every morning. And for that, you ought to stop and say, thank you. A sila will make you stop and tell the Lord, thank you. Sila is, is, a, is a pause to just take it all in. Acknowledge the moment. Habakkuk 2.20. I think we opened some mics. If we did, turn them, turn them off. Uh, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Sila. You see that? The Lord is here. So when you hear that all the earth keeps silent, it's, it's a selah. 
It's a pause. It's reflective. Psalm 46, 10. Stay with me. Be still and know that I am God. The God of Jacob is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Now, now think about the God of Jacob. Why does he say that? The God of Jacob. What did Jacob do with his lying, conniving, deceitful self? The God of Jacob is our refuge. The same way he took in Jacob. Come on. The same way he forgave Jacob. The same way he chose Jacob. Before he had a chance to do good or evil, he chose Jacob. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. Come on. Jacob wrestled. God changed his name. Come on. Still, he said, be still and know that I am God. The word still, that means to rest, to let go, to release something, to exhale. But yes, yeah, Stella, <laughs> you've been waiting to exhale. Exhale. Psalm 4, 4, meditate with your heart on your bed and be still. Selah. Before you get out of bed. Meditate. Based on our text then, Selah means to stop and think about what it is that you may need to do in order to get God's favor back into your life and his hand of discipline off your neck. Remember, it's a song of instruction. So verse 5 says, uh, watch this, it's going to help you. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity have I hidden. I said, I, I will confess I have not hidden. I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Let me read that another translation. You ain't said nothing. Finally, he said, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Selah or interlude. He said, man, think about that. He said, reflect on that. I confessed all my sins. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I confessed my rebellion to the Lord. And he forgave me. He said, Selah. Praise break. He said, just stop right there. David again teaches us how to get right with God if you're right with God. I'm going to say that for the folk in the back back there. I think they missed that. I put it on the screen this time. David teaches us how to get right with God if you're right with God. David teaches the righteous how to get right with God when you're already right with God. He teaches those who have fallen away, those who have gotten into a state of rebellion, those who are slipping into darkness. David teaches us how to get right with God when we're right with God. That is good news. I'm telling y'all, uh, you didn't get it. What, what then does the psalmist encourage us all to do in order for this to happen? Verse 6, therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. He said, if you will pray to God, you won't drown. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe is, am I? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. I cried out. This poor man cried and you heard my cry. I called on the Lord and he was near unto me. David says you call on him you pray to him. He will answer you. He will lift you from the flood waters of judgment. He will take away the pain of your sin. David said let everybody do what I did. Just fess up. Turn back to God. Cry out to him. Pray. Seek his first. Come on y'all. This is about believers here. First John 1 still works for the children of God. First John is about believers. We say if we confess our sin, he said that ain't for unsaved folk. That's for the saved folk. Those who are right with God. Listen to it. First John 1 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is not for heathens. This is for the people of God. This is what David was talking about. I cried out to God. I confessed my sins. He washed my sins, forgave my sins, forgave my iniquity, forgave my transgressions. He covered me. He imputed his righteousness unto me. Come on. He blotted out, annihilated my old ways. So here we go to the conclusion. Verse number seven. He says, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Here's why we shout in here. Here's why we still have joy. David said, because God, you hid me when the enemy came to find me he couldn't find me God you hid me God you held me in the hollow of your head God you set me upon a rock you hid me God you wouldn't let the enemy have his way with me when I walked through the valley of the shadow of death I didn't have to fear any evil because you were with me your shadow was overshadowing the shadow of death God you are my refuge God you are my strength you are my high tower God you are a place where I can run in and be safe you hid me then he said God you preserved me from trouble you kept me from more than I can handle you didn't let the devil have complete and total control in my life you knew how much I can bear come on y'all greet later back there enjoy the best and stop all that hugging and kissing and so God wants us to know that he is our God he preserves us from trouble he preserves us in our struggles he keeps us from being booked hooked up how many know there's some things that the devil knows you can't handle and if he can have free course in your life it'll drive you crazy but God draws a line and say no father when they come in to eat up your flesh they stumble and they fall why do you think Brent Brown is in this place tonight why do you think people like Sean Williams are still pressing their way Clementine Smith still pressing their way why do you think that there are people who lost loved ones during this COVID and people who are losing one loved ones now it seems for no reason whatsoever what makes them tick what helps them keep going what is it God is their strength God is their help God is their deliverer and we're surrounded by songs of deliverance that's why we sing because we're happy we sing because we're free his eye is on the sparrow and we know that his eye watches over me how many y'all know that God sees you if he feeds the little birds he'll take care of you if he clothes the lilies he'll take care of you you're surrounded it just looks like we're surrounded but we're surrounded by him God you give me songs of praise God you give me songs of thanksgiving because of what you've done for me oh 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 what you've done for me oh 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 what he's done for me oh 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 what he's done for me I never shall forget what you've done for me come on you took my feet out of miry clay that's what you've done for me you set me on a rock to stay that's what you've done for me Oh, 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 what you done for me? I'll never shall forget what you've done for me. Put your hands together, jump up on your feet, and thank God for this Sila moment. Reflect over your life. Look back and thank God. You should have been dead. You should have been gone. But God had mercy on you because you're a man. You're a woman after his own heart. And before it's all over, you shall do everything that God has purposed you to do. Before it's all over. You're not going to leave here until your assignment is done. You're not going to leave here until you completed your task. Until you helped the last person. Until you blessed the last person. Come on, you're not going to leave here until you sung the right song. Played the right instrument. Got the right job. Bless your right neighbor. Come on, you're not going to leave here until you've been the best wife. You've been the best husband. You've been the best daughter. You've been the best son that you can be. God God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life don't quit don't give up God's got you he's your refuge God's got you he'll hide you he'll keep you preserve you he'll protect you and put a song on the inside of you throw your head back reach way down and What he done for you, what he done for you. 
Sila, Sila, Sila. Come on. Sila, Sila, Sila. Come on. Sila, Sila, Sila. They dance because of what he's done for them. They sing because of what he's done for them. They play their instruments because of what he's done for them. You shout because of what he's done for you. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for us, come on, shout in here. Come on, dance in here. Come on, leap in here. He gives us songs of deliverance. Got a real trump over there now. I knew something was different. <laughs> what he done for me? What he done for me? Come on. What he done for me? Come on. What he done for me? I've never seen a pork yet. But throw it down. Love it. Oh, what he done for me? Oh, what he done for me? What he's done. Come on. Did he take your feet out of my clay? That's what he did for me. Did he take your feet out of the Mary clay? That's what he did for me. Did he take your feet out of the Mary clay? That's what he's did for me. I never shall forget what he's done. Everybody say, Oh, what he's done for me. Say, Oh, what he's done for me. Say, Oh, what he's done for me. I never shall forget. for a moment. Take a break right now. Step back. Engage yourself in this interlude. Let God have his way in your life. Let him know that you love him with everything in you. That you know he's been good. You know he covered you. You know he washed you. He annihilated your old flesh. He made you a brand new creature. When you think about how good he is, don't rejoice that demons are subject, but rejoice that your names have been written in the Lamb book of life. Rejoice that heaven is going to be your home. I don't care what the devil tries to do down here. He can only go so far because God's got you covered. Everybody. Oh, say, oh, what he's done for me. Oh, what he's done for me. I never shall forget what he's done for me.
This is for Reese. For the things. For the things. Every little thing that he's ever done for you, see a think about it. For the things. For the things. He. He. We know who we're talking about. To God. To God. not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Allah, to God. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the Just step back, think about it, and then give God some praise. Just take a moment, stop life. It's usually eight bar hook, but let's just stick in the loot in here, a C line here after the third bar, the fifth bar for a moment on what you just said on what just happened on what you're going through and how God has kept you every step of the way we use David tonight because he's a man that had more issues than Carter got liver pills and God said he's a man after my own heart some of you have felt so defeated and so deflated and so dilapidated and so unworthy and you are in and of yourself but your unworthiness makes you a candidate for God's grace and God's delivering power. Come on, if you really love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, I can promise you one thing. In the end, you're going to win. Come on, I can promise you that everything is going to be all right. I got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. And if you can't help me, please don't stop me. Get out of my way. Don't try to block me. I got a race to run. And I'm running by me. At the finish of the line, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to see God's face. I walked over to Michael Lee tonight. And I gave him my traditional kiss on the jaw. I always kiss him to make him wonder, is it a man or is it a woman? And every time I kiss him, he said, oh, sir, I miss you. And it's always a hug there. And I want him to know that you've heard me use this testimony many times, completely and totally blind, and serves God and loves God like no man I know. Come on, on this planet. I don't forget people. I'm pulled on around the world, to be honest with you. I was reflecting this week in Vegas. Not just Africa, not just Australia, South America, different states, countries, and now part of this apostolic global movement. 
and there are people that pull and there's some people along the way as I meet them I go wow God thank you for hooking me up with them thank you for them pushing me thank you for their presence in my life and I use Mike as an example because I know even though elders and deacons and workers and leaders sometimes aren't as enthusiastic about God as they used to be it's just good to see people who have nothing to gain but heaven to be in the presence of God and in the house of God oh God everything that's why Brent blessed me tonight I think about you coming up in ministry ministries you've been in and things that you've done in ministry then I think about the years we've been together the multiple messages that I have preached and the things that I've seen you take to heart and now at a time like this being able to be in the presence of God in the house of God and it's strong knowing what you know knowing what you know about your son and knowing what you know and still God I, what did David say I'm gonna wash my face anoint my head I, uh, you know I can't do nothing about it now I, I've got a charge to keep in a God to glorify and um, you bless me you you, know, you really you really bless me when I talked to you on the phone when I hung up in Vegas when we hung up I, I, I didn't feel good for a moment I think I, I felt with you and I felt for you and I got very still and very quiet and I pulled away for a sila and I reflected and I said to myself God you know you're still good and you're still God nothing changes who you are nothing changes who you are and Brent is your son he's your son he's a wannabe tenor in a baritone body with a bass inclination but he's your son he's your son glory hallelujah I love you man and I thank God for all of you and those of you that prayed for us when we were gone is that you? If that's you, could you just put your hands together? Because I think I felt every one of your prayers. You may be seated. We're going to get out of here. We're going to receive an offering here and online. We're able to go to the gym every day. Man, I got some kinks out. I got some stuff out that I didn't know I had in. And how many of y'all need to get back in the gym? Let me see your hand. You need to get back in there. You need to work out. You're not too late. It ain't too old. Trust me, I'm going to tell you what I know. But I was able to burn thousands of calories a day and, and do some stuff. And it was really wonderful. And then walking a hundred, my wife's feet was peeled and scaled and everything else from walking. And we had no idea how hot it was till we looked down and saw our feet. And uh, it's just scorched. And, uh, but it was good. You need an envelope, get an envelope. If you're at home and you want to give, you can give electronically. There are four ways that you can give. Um, you can choose one of those four ways. I think, yeah, there's on the screen over there, uh, on the side screens. You can give uh, by text, online, uh, ministry, and mail in. And listen, this coming Sunday, if you haven't been out to worship yet, sign up. Come out to the house of God. We got plenty of seats for you. Now, if you're comfortable with it and you're feeling okay and everything's all right, come out to the house of God. Be here with us this coming Sunday. It's going to be a very powerful message on this council culture. And I really believe that God is going to speak to this culture. I really believe he's going to give us equipment to handle what's going on right now in the world. So be here. Be here. I'm going to talk about the hypocrisy and the schizophrenia of this culture. And God is going to, I'm sure, bless you and give you some fuel for this fire that we find ourselves in. Not to burn us up. Oh, they could turn it up seven times higher. Because there's a fourth man. Well, like unto the Son of God. There is a fourth man in our fire. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. If you want to give, have you received now? Have we done it? We good to go? God bless you. So and those of you that are watching online, until next time, may God bless you and God keep you. This coming Friday night. Remember, this coming Friday, I think we've got something called Friday night. What is it, Friday? First Friday. Right, you need to come out on this first Friday of every month. And we're going to be in the, in the mall section, Kingdom Plaza, bowling and doing all kinds of good stuff. And then on the 4th of July, there's going to be a major celebration. You're going to be hearing more about that 
uh, this coming week check us out on the Facebook page and uh, our website and you'll be able to get all of the details so until then Friday night uh, first Fridays and Friday Night Live those of you that are out of town and can't be here you can watch and get a word from the Lord see you until then bye bye God bless y'all put your hands together come on like you mean it like y'all Amen. We pray you were blessed by the worship experience here at the Potter's House. Make sure you share this word with a loved one on your timeline and newsfeed. And remember, there are five ways that you can give. First, you can give by text by simply texting the word GIVE to 904-601-1695. Follow the prompts and you will receive a confirmation text of your gift. You may also give online at tphim.org backslash give. You can give through our Ministry One or Ezekiel Church app by downloading the app and following the instructions to give. Or you can mail in your gifts addressed to TPHIM at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. Once again, we thank you for your continued generosity to the Potter's House. And for those of you who have answered the call to salvation, please call or text us at 855-TPH4JAX. That's 855-874-4529. And until the next time, remember to share this message and stay connected via Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJAX. May God bless you and keep you until our next digital gathering.